Autobiography of a Yogi, Autobiography of a Yogi Yogananda. by Paramhansa Yogananda. Chapter 1, My Parents and Early Life The characteristic features of Indian culture have long been a search for ultimate verities and the concomitant disciple-guru relationship. My own path led me to a Christ-like sage whose beautiful life was chiseled for the ages. He was one of the great masters who are India's sole remaining wealth. Emerging in every generation, they have bulwarked their land against the fate of Babylon and Egypt. I find my earliest memories covering the anachronistic features of a previous incarnation. Clear recollections came to me of a distant life, a yogi amidst the Himalayan snows. These glimpses of the past by some dimensionless link also afforded me a glimpse of the future. The helpless humiliations of infancy are not banished from my mind. I was resentfully conscious of not being able to walk or express myself freely. Prayerful surges arose within me as I realized my bodily impotence. My strong emotional life took silent form as words in many languages. Among the inward confusion of tongues, my ear gradually accustomed itself to the circumambient Bengali syllables of my people. The beguiling scope of an infant's mind adultly considered limited to toys and toes. Psychological ferment and my unresponsive body brought me to many obstinate crying spells. I recall the general family bewilderment at my distress. Happier memories, too, crowd in on me, my mother's caresses, and my first attempts at lisping phrase and toddling step. These early triumphs, usually forgotten quickly, are yet a natural basis of self-confidence. My far-reaching memories are not unique. Many yogis are known to have retained their self-consciousness without interruption by the dramatic transition to and from so-called life and death. If man be solely a body, its loss indeed places the final period to identity. But if prophets down the millenniums spake with truth, Man is essentially of incorporeal nature. The persistent core of human egoity is only temporarily allied with sense perception. Although odd, clear memories of infancy are not extremely rare. During travels in numerous lands, I have listened to early recollections from the lips of voracious men and women. I was born in the last decade of the 19th century and passed my first eight years at Gorakhpur. This was my birthplace in the United Provinces of Northeastern India. We were eight children, four boys and four girls. I, Mukunda Lal Ghosh, was the second son and the fourth child. Father and mother were Bengalis of the Kshatriya caste. Both were blessed with saintly nature. Their mutual love, tranquil and dignified, never expressed itself frivolously. A perfect parental harmony was the calm center for
for the revolving tumult of eight young lives. Father Bhagavati Charan Ghosh was kind, grave, at times stern. Loving him dearly, we children yet observed a certain reverential distance. An outstanding mathematician and logician, he was guided principally by his intellect. But Mother was a queen of hearts and taught us only through love. After her death, Father displayed more of his inner tenderness. I noticed then that his gaze often metamorphosed into my mother's. In mother's presence, we tasted our earliest bittersweet acquaintance with the scriptures. Tales from the Mahabharata and Ramayana were resourcefully summoned to meet the exigencies of discipline. Instruction and chastisement went hand in hand. A daily gesture of respect to Father was given by Mother's dressing us carefully in the afternoons to welcome him home from the office. His position was similar to that of a vice president in the Bengal Nagpur Railway, one of India's large companies. His work involved traveling, and our family lived in several cities during my childhood. Mother held an open hand toward the needy. Father was also kindly disposed, but his respect for law and order extended to the budget. One fortnight Mother spent in feeding the poor more than Father's monthly income. All I ask, please, is to keep your charities within a reasonable limit. Even a gentle rebuke from her husband was grievous to Mother. She ordered a hackney carriage, not hinting to the children at any disagreement. Goodbye, I am going away to my mother's home. Ancient ultimatum. We broke into astounded lamentations. Our maternal uncle arrived opportunely. He whispered to father some sage counsel, garnered no doubt from the ages. After father had made a few conciliatory remarks, mother happily dismissed the cab. Thus ended the only trouble I ever noticed between my parents. But I recall a characteristic discussion. Please give me ten rupees for a hapless woman who has just arrived at the house. Mother's smile had its own persuasion. Why ten rupees? One is enough. Father added a justification. When my father and grandparents died suddenly, I had my first taste of poverty. My only breakfast before walking miles to my school was a small banana. Later, at the university, I was in such need that I applied to a wealthy judge for aid of one rupee per month. He declined, remarking that even a rupee is important. How bitterly you recall the denial of that rupee. Mother's heart had an instant logic. Do you want this woman also to remember painfully your refusal of ten rupees which she needs urgently? You win. With the immemorial gesture of vanquished husbands, he opened his wallet. Here is a ten rupee note. Give it to her with my good will. Father tended first to say no to any new proposal. His attitude toward the strange woman who so readily enlisted mother's sympathy was an example of his customary caution. Aversion to instant acceptance, typical of the French mind in the West, is really only honoring the principle of, quote, due reflection. I always found Father reasonable and evenly balanced in his judgments. If I could bolster up my numerous requests with one or two good arguments, he invariably put the coveted goal within my reach, whether it were a vacation trip or a new motorcycle. Father was a strict disciplinarian to his children in their early years, but his attitude toward himself was truly Spartan. 
He never visited the theater, for instance, but sought his recreation in various spiritual practices and in reading the Bhagavad Gita. Shunning all luxuries, he would cling to one old pair of shoes until they were useless. His sons bought automobiles after they came into popular use, but father was always content with the trolley car for his daily ride to the office. The accumulation of money for the sake of power was alien to his nature. Once, after organizing the Calcutta Urban Bank, he refused to benefit himself by holding any of its shares. He had simply wished to perform a civic duty in his spare time. Several years after father had retired on a pension, an English accountant arrived to examine the books of the Bengal Nagpur Railway Company. The amazed investigator discovered that father had never applied for overdue bonuses. He did the work of three men, the accountant told the company. He has rupees 125,000, that is about $41,250, owing to him as back compensation. The officials presented father with a check for this amount. He thought so little about it that he overlooked any mention to the family. Much later he was questioned by my youngest brother, Bishnu, who noticed the large deposit on a bank statement. Why be elated by material profit, father replied. The one who pursues a goal of even-mindedness is neither jubilant with gain nor depressed by loss. He knows that man arrives penniless in this world and departs without a single rupee. Early in their married life, my parents became disciples of a great master, Lahiri Mahashai of Benares. This contact strengthened father's naturally ascetic temperament. Mother made a remarkable admission to my eldest sister, Roma. Your father and myself live together as man and wife only once a year for the purpose of having children. Father first met Lahiri Mahashai through Abhinash Babu, an employee in the Gorakhpur office of the Bengal Nagpur Railway. Abhinash instructed my young ears with engrossing tales of many Indian saints. He invariably concluded with a tribute to the superior glories of his own guru. Did you ever hear of the extraordinary circumstances under which your father became a disciple of Lahiri Mahashai? It was on a lazy summer afternoon as Abhinash and I sat together in the compound of my home that he put this intriguing question. I shook my head with a smile of anticipation. Years ago, before you were born, I asked my superior officer, your father, to give me a week's leave from my Gorakhpur duties in order to visit my guru in Benares. Your father ridiculed my plan. Are you going to become a religious fanatic, he inquired. Concentrate on your office work if you want to forge ahead. Sadly walking home along a wooded path that day, I met your father in a palanquin. He dismissed his servants and conveyance and fell into step beside me. Seeking to console me, he pointed out the advantages of striving for worldly success. But I heard him listlessly. My heart was repeating, Lahiri Mahashai, I cannot live without seeing you. Our path took us to the edge of a tranquil field where the rays of the late afternoon sun were still crowning the tall ripple of the wild grass. We paused in admiration. There, in the field, only a few yards from us, the form of my great guru suddenly appeared. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. His voice resonant in our astounded ears. He vanished as mysteriously as he had come. On my knees I was exclaiming, Lahiri Mahashai, Lahiri Mahashai. Your father was motionless with stupefaction for a few moments. 
Abinash, not only do I give you leave, but I give myself leave to start for Benares tomorrow. I must know this great Lahiri Mahashai, who is able to materialize himself at will in order to intercede for you. I will take my wife and ask this master to initiate us in his spiritual path. Will you guide us to him? Of course! Joy filled me at the miraculous answer to my prayer and the quick, favorable turn of events. The next evening your parents and I entrained for Benares. We took a horse cart the following day and then had to walk through narrow lanes to my guru's secluded home. Entering his little parlor, we bowed before the master and locked in his habitual lotus posture. He blinked his piercing eyes and leveled them on your father. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. His words were the same as those he had used two days before in the Gorakhpur field. He added, I am glad that you have allowed Abhinash to visit me and that you and your wife have accompanied him. To their joy, he initiated your parents in the spiritual practice of Kriya Yoga. Your father and I, as brother disciples, have been close friends since the memorable day of the vision. Lahiri Mahashai took a definite interest in your own birth. Your life shall surely be linked with his own. The Master's blessing never fails. Lahiri Mahashai left this world shortly after I had entered it. His picture in an ornate frame always graced our family altar in the various cities to which Father was transferred by his office. Many a morning and evening found Mother and me meditating before an improvised shrine, offering flowers dipped in fragrant sandalwood paste. With frankincense and myrrh, as well as our united devotions, we honored the divinity which had found full expression in Lahiri Mahashai. His picture had a surpassing influence over my life. As I grew, the thought of the Master grew with me. In meditation I would often see his photographic image emerge from its small frame and, taking a living form, sit before me. When I attempted to touch the feet of his luminous body, it would change and again become the picture. As childhood slipped into boyhood, I found Lahiri Mahashai transformed in my mind from a little image cribbed in a frame to a living, enlightening presence. I frequently prayed to him in moments of trial or confusion, finding within me his solacing direction. At first I grieved because he was no longer physically living. As I began to discover his secret omnipresence, I lamented no more. He had often written to those of his disciples who were over-anxious to see him, Why come to view my bones and flesh when I am ever within range of your kutastha, that is to say, spiritual sight? I was blessed about the age of eight with a wonderful healing through the photograph of Lahiri Mohashai. This experience gave intensification to my love. While at our family estate in Ichapur, Bengal, I was stricken with Asiatic cholera. My life was despaired of. The doctors could do nothing. At my bedside, Mother frantically motioned me to look at Lahiri Mahashai's picture on the wall above my head. Bow to him mentally. She knew I was too feeble even to lift my hands in salutation. If you really show your devotion and inwardly kneel before him, your life will be spared. I gazed at his photograph and saw there a blinding light enveloping my body and the entire room. My nausea and other uncontrollable symptoms disappeared. I was well. 
At once I felt strong enough to bend over and touch Mother's feet in appreciation of her immeasurable faith in her guru. Mother pressed her head repeatedly against the little picture. Oh, omnipresent Master, I thank thee that thy light hath healed my son. I realized that she too had witnessed the luminous blaze through which I had instantly recovered from a usually fatal disease. One of my most precious possessions is that same photograph. Given to Father by Lahiri Mahashai himself, it carries a holy vibration. The picture had a miraculous origin. I heard the story from Father's brother disciple, Kali Kumar Roy. It appears that the Master had an aversion to being photographed. Over his protest, a group picture was once taken of him and a cluster of devotees, including Kali Kumar Roy. It was an amazed photographer who discovered that the plate, which had clear images of all the disciples, revealed nothing more than a blank space in the center where he had reasonably expected to find the outlines of Lahiri Mahashai. The phenomenon was widely discussed. A certain student and expert photographer, Gangadhar Babu, boasted that the fugitive figure would not escape him. The next morning, as the guru sat in lotus posture on a wooden bench with a screen behind him, Gangadhar Babu arrived with his equipment. Taking every precaution for success, he greedily exposed twelve plates. On each one he soon found the imprint of the wooden bench and screen, but once again the master's form was missing. With tears and shattered pride, Gangadhar Babu sought out his guru. It was many hours before Lahiri Mahashai broke his silence with a pregnant comment. I am spirit. Can your camera reflect the omnipresent invisible? I see it cannot, but, holy sir, I lovingly desire a picture of the bodily temple where alone to my narrow vision that spirit appears fully to dwell. Come then tomorrow, I will pose for you. Again the photographer focused his camera. This time the sacred figure, not cloaked with mysterious imperceptibility, was sharp on the plate. The master never posed for another picture, at least I have seen none. The photograph is reproduced in this book. Lahiri Mahashai's fair features of a universal caste hardly suggest to what race he belonged. His intense joy of God communion is slightly revealed in a somewhat enigmatic smile. His eyes half open to denote a nominal direction to the outer world, are half closed also, completely oblivious to the poor lures of the earth. He was fully awake at all times to the spiritual problems of seekers who approached for his bounty. Shortly after my healing through the potency of the Guru's picture, I had an influential spiritual vision Sitting on my bed one morning, I fell into a deep reverie. What is behind the darkness of closed eyes? This probing thought came powerfully into my mind. An immense flash of light at once manifested to my inward gaze. Divine shapes of saints, sitting in meditation posture in mountain caves, formed like miniature cinema pictures on the large screen of radiance within my forehead. Who are you? I spoke aloud. We are the Himalayan yogis. The celestial response is difficult to describe. My heart was thrilled. Ah, I long to go to the Himalayas and become like you. The vision vanished but the silvery beams expanded in ever-widening circles to infinity. What is this wondrous...